All right, welcome everyone. Hello. Hi. We're so glad to be back in the world of webinars and uh, <laughs> representing Junietta College, a uh, thriving uh, webinar really for the parents of our incoming students, but with information relevant to all parents and families and to students. If students, if you're tuning in, we welcome your uh, viewership as well. Actually, we'll take all people who want to be a part of our <laughs> webinar experience. Anyone with questions? My name is Matthew Damschoter, and I am Vice President of Student Life and Dean of Students here at Juniata College. It is a pleasure and an honor and a calling to be present in this space with you. I forget that there's a need for an introduction every time. There is, because every episode <laughs> is a new opportunity to embrace, yeah. embrace the public. Hi, <laughs> Davion Clayton, uh, second year engineering physics POE here at the school at Juniata, thriving um, and having a good time. That's I'm right. My best. A living example of our work and success. Even though he's upset that I, I'm wearing my um, high school sweater. <laughs> I did. I criticized uh, I criticized my co-head. I said, why aren't you repping our Rest institution? Start. I'd like to point out that I, <laughs> I'm yet to wear a Juniata attire when I came on the show. Yeah. I know. You usually wear black. Yes. And you look great in it. Oh, well, that's my uh, thing. It's, you know, it's really people like find their own style. And uh, it's very fall it <laughs> It's sweatshirt weather here in Huntingdon, which is actually a treat and a treasure. Oh, I feel like I've been waiting a long time. To I'm, not, I'm not a summer dress. I can't stand the heat. <laughs> Wait, one more <laughs> intro. One more intro. And we are excited. I'll introduce oh, you because you're our guest. Thanks. thanks. I'm the guest. Uh, and we are so excited to welcome back uh, Dr. Celia Cook Huffman, who is. Uh, the assistant provost at Juniata and coordinates uh, and directs the efforts of Quest, which is our academic success center. Uh, Quest serves the needs of students through academic advising, through the Office of Accessibility Services, through case management, through community engagement, through career development, through general problem solving tutoring, tutoring. for all things that come yep. through the door, tutoring. Yep. Yep. Uh, it is really a one-stop shop for students and uh, as a colleague, Celia has a care and I think a kindness that you show Thanks. really to everyone who comes through the door uh, as they both need services and also probably a big warm hug, figuratively, <laughs> sometimes literally. Sometimes <laughs> I brightened someone's mood with a hug today. I felt very, <laughs> felt very fulfilled. But it is a, a pleasure to welcome you. Thanks. Back. So glad to be here. Back. 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 I know, my second time. <laughs> So uh, we are about a week and a half away from fall break. We are. And Phase, I can tell hours, you, minutes. people are <laughs> counting down. Tick tock, tick tock. Yes. yes. Students are ready to go. And I think everyone's ready to see them go. It oh. hasn't been that bad. <laughs> Jeez. Although the campus doesn't close for fall break, right. Right, yeah. students, uh, many students Press stay. Will be open. It's a great time to come in and chat. Yeah. We have about 500 students that will stay because they're athletes or because they live too far from home to make the trip home because they want to study and just not have days of class but still use some campus Here resources. Here in the theater production. Of Julius Caesar. Which is prepping hard <laughs> over the weekend and then we'll get um, its run. So fall break, well needed, well deserved. I'm excited about it. It's going to be a great time. We have one episode left. Before that, we'll be talking about financial planning and preparing for the spring sort of payment cycle. And that's a particular salience to some families, probably to all families as, uh, mm -hmm. you know, finances continue to be something that emerges, at least in my house, uh, on a month-to-month -month basis. You had, your, you had your financial plan last week. <laughs> I know, I was like working on my personal budget and uh, and I was queried on it because I think you thought I was actually doing college work. Or something. Yeah, I thought you were doing like, the school budget. I had no idea that oh, was in your job description. I wish it had not. so few lines uh, on my school budget. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we are uh, also just a couple weeks away from the opening kind of salvo of advising and registration for spring classes. Yes, we are. And students at Juniata register every semester for the next semester's mm -hmm. class. But they do that course registration with an eye towards not just the next semester, but the semester mm -hmm. that follows and the right. year and two years mm -hmm. in graduation. Okay. Uh, and yeah. it's an evolving plan, but it's a conversation, I think, that happens during the advising mm -hmm. process and, and mm -hmm. through those relationships. I'm one of 
gave me advisors. Aww. Does he give you good advice? <laughs> um, for the most part, I haven't asked for it. <laughs> I'm new to the role. Oh, for that's awesome. you. Maybe, you should, maybe you give him advice. I don't feel like I'm that wise yet. <laughs> oh, I I do take good good direction from you. Usually, I just you know, come in here yes. and we have conversation. If I if I'm in some sort of uh, situation or whatever the case might be, we just talk through it. Yeah. That's usually how it goes with most of the people that I talk to around yeah. here. Um, Sai, who we'll be seeing later, but uh, whenever I have a conversation with her or Dr. G or Tasia, they solve all my issues. Yeah, nice. I got people around here. So what's beautiful yeah, about that, or my observation of that, is that students have many advisors mm -hmm. on campus. And yes. we talk about a two-advisor system. Yes. But students have many mm -hmm. advisors. Can, can you talk about why it is part of our campus mm -hmm. ethos to have at least a two-advisor system? Sure, sure. So advisor. we understand, right, that some students come in with a lot of experience mm -hmm. or expectations or, like, know what they want to do. And some students come in with a moderate set of those things. And some students come into the college experience without really having maybe navigated college or um, – a campus like ours in any way, shape, or form. So we want to make sure that we are meeting students where they are and getting them all the information that they need to be academically successful, but also successful in all aspects of their college journey, curricular and co-curricular. Um, and so we have a two advisor system, an academic advisor and a mentor to make sure that we are having those kinds of conversations that you're talking about with every student, making sure they have people, right, who are, who know them, who can attend to them, who can help them think through big problems, what I want to do with my life, what's my purpose and meaning, as well as, hmm, if I know what my purpose and meaning is, how do I develop an academic plan? What courses do I take to make sure that I can graduate in a timely manner? So I, I think, you know, my experience, and I was one of those kids who came from a small town, I didn't mm -hmm. have family who could help inform my decision making, I was really counting on the people mm -hmm kind of at yeah. the institution to help me even figure out what it yeah. meant to choose courses and, you know, make them speak together mm -hmm. in, a, in a coherent curriculum. Yeah. You know, what, and, and so there's kind of the higher level piece of that mm -hmm. kind of discernment around mm -hmm. vocation and career. And then there's logistics. Mm -hmm. And maybe right. we'll set that aside for the moment. Okay. Sure. You know, for students who want to have those conversations around who they are, Mm -hmm. and how they incorporate their values into a right. career choice, mm -hmm. how, how might they find their pathway to that mm -hmm. conversation? Sure. So every student has, as we said, an academic advisor and a mentor. And part of the mentor's job really is to help with those big thinking kinds of questions, to ask, to help students just think out loud and explore um, and invite students to talk about, well, what interests you? Um, how, how do you figure out what you're interested in? What kind of courses, given what you might know about what you like to do or what you don't like to do, what kind of courses might help you then figure out your vocation and your path and what you would like to do with your sort of personal and professional life after you graduate? So mentors are a great resource for that. I think just the nature of the school being a liberal arts school, it gives you the well-roundedness mm -hmm. in your classes, even if you're not ready to talk to. How we, we mentioned last week, um, finding the right people to talk to. Even if you don't know who you want to talk to as of yet, your classes will likely mm -hmm. round out your interests and uh, you'll start leaning towards where you want to go. Well, I remember when I was, you know, and, and I'll, I went to college at least five years ago. I'll date myself. Uh, yeah, me too. But I, me I, too, I remember, now that you mention it. I remember my, you know, very high energy orientation mm -hmm. leader handing us, it was on newsprint. It was like the course <laughs> listing, right? Yeah, and it sure. was all the different courses mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. we would select from. And I was overwhelmed by it. I mean, yeah. there were a thousand courses, or it mm -hmm. seemed like a thousand courses mm -hmm. <laughs> to sort of clock through. And, you know, I said, well, what? how do I pick? And she's, mm -hmm. she said, just pick five. <laughs> Elementally count. Yeah, you know, right. like, just yeah. pick some things that interest mm -hmm. you. And it seemed so hard to wrap my mm -hmm. mind around that. Mm -hmm. How How do students yeah. kind of, lay out a schedule. What sort of resources are available to help guide that kind of planning for students maybe who are more structured? Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead, you wanna, tell us what you've done. I think I think our scheduling assistant through Moodle, is it? You know, uh, it, you know go, I know you don't arch. have Arch. Oh, it's through the Arch, arch. Right? okay. So yeah. course, this course scheduling assistant. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. one of the online resources, but right. I, thought, I thought it was like a um, sub, like a subcategory for Moodle or something, but I'm wrong. But 
So you go, I usually, he I, finds it. Don't I worry, find, he's I registered for class. The link is right there. Yeah. yeah. So I always <laughs> use that and it's nicely color coded and it'll put it on a timetable for um, Monday through Friday and it'll have all the times of the day from like seven to whatever time the latest course will go. And then when you put in the courses, when you select the courses that you want, it'll um, nicely put in the dates and the time in which that mm-hmm. class will meet each time throughout the week. And if you put in classes that conflict in scheduling, then it'll tell you which ones conflict conflict with which. And if you're having a hard time deciding, I think you're in a good in a good spot if you're having a hard time deciding which ones you want to keep. I mm-hmm. think it's it's um, yeah, harder to figure to out which ones yeah. you want. Mm-hmm. So um if you're if you're at a point where you have to start canceling or getting rid of some of those courses, that's a good thing. And it's just a matter of prioritizing with what you fit, what you what excites you more. Mm-hmm. If you haven't chosen a POE or um, a program of emphasis yet, you just um, choose the ones that you feel more excited for, and you keep those, and you lay off on the ones that you have to get rid of for another time. Yeah. And who knows? Maybe you end up not even taking them at all because you liked what you ended up picking so much. So that's that's what I always use. Yeah. So, so is it better to pick a few extras and have those in reserve before you go in to that advising conversation? Should you just go in with your ideal? And as a first year student, are you likely to get the five that you picked, your top five? Um, well, for me, as a engineering physics person, I had my course requirements for the semester. And, you know, you once you, if you come in knowing what you want to do, you have kind of a breakdown of all the courses that you need throughout your four years and your advisor will help you schedule it to break it down to make it a manageable semester semester after semester um for the courses make sure it's not overwhelming and stuff if you don't if you're not in a position in which you know what you want to do and you need help um selecting which courses you do want to take i think it would be better to have the ones that you know that you want to do, like I personally know I want to take sociology and psychology at some point. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I keep that in my pocket. I have, I'm yet to be able to take those courses because um, course requirements and other things in which I ended up wanting to do a little more than those. I ended up taking last semester, Mm -hmm. but I still have, you know, the psychology and sociology um, kept with me. And whenever I make advising appointments and I speak about if I if we are speaking about my next semester, my next um, course uh, enrollment, then I ask about if it's a good idea. Um, will I be able? Will I likely be able to manage it? Does it seem like something that's um, going to, in the long run, be a success for me? If it's going to work for me, if it's a good idea. And what seems like helpful is that because your academic advisor is also a faculty member in your discipline, Mm -hmm. they can tell you, I think, what the demands of those higher level classes are. Right, way, kind of do you have the right sort of breadth of of, um, courses and right, what's the workload gonna look like and how is it gonna be across those courses? And they they always, like they they have the advantage of seeing seeing it through with the students that have come before you, mm-hmm. so they'll know just by um, what they heard from their past sure. advisees, like what what's a good idea, what seems to be manageable based on the mm-hmm. re- required course load, yeah. and what you're trying to take mm-hmm. on as well. Yeah. So, so the kind of sensibility is that students take about five classes yes. or about. Yes. Five, 15, 15, hours. 15, hours, 15 credit hours. But it's less. okay to go a little less. A little more, it's okay a little to more. go a credit more. Yeah, 12, yeah. 16, 13. Yeah. Absolutely. It gets challenging, I think, when students get into the space of 18 credits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's both, I think, like too many credits, but sometimes it can also be because there's maybe you have some smaller credit classes and also juggling like six or seven classes, yeah. right? It's it overwhelming just in terms of finding time for. Right, the other things you need to do to rest and relax a little bit, study time. So that'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. five is a great number. You talked about the course scheduler. That's a great place to go and see what courses are being offered this coming spring semester. Students can also go to the course catalog 
which lists all the courses that are offered at Juniata. And that's a great way to do some of that exploring that you were talking about, right? Or maybe I want to take this mm. and this, maybe not this semester, but wow, that course sounds really interesting. Or I know I want to do some psychology at some point. Yeah, and and all of that gives you that schedule yes, paper. Right. So, and all right. of that information is helpful to the advisor when you go to meet with them to say, here's what I think I'd like in the spring, but I'm also interested in these kinds mm. of things. And that way, if a course fills up or if something doesn't fit in your schedule, right, the advisors have something to work with you talking about, well, what else might you take? What else are you interested in? I was that kid that went through the course catalog and it was like shopping for Christmas mm -hmm. or, you know, mm -hmm. and I would like write down mm -hmm. all the courses I wanted to take by their names. Yeah. Uh, I would also go to, the, I would go to the bookstore and look at the books and be like, oh, I want to yes, read that one right? and I want to read that one. And then and I would I sign get up credit for, for courses it. that yeah. Uh, what a delight. That's that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, are, are there wait lists? If a, let's say a student yes. wants to get in, how, how does that process work? Because mm -hmm. registration takes place in the next month. Mm -hmm. Classes don't start until January. There's going to be a lot of shifting. There's a lot of shifting around. So if a class looks like it's full, it's always a great idea to put yourself on the wait list. And that way, if the space opens up, there's a possibility that you're you know at the top of the wait list or if you have a kind of priority if you're a senior right who needs the class then you're more likely to get into it it's always a good idea also to go introduce yourself to the faculty member yes, if it's is. a new person because a face and a name together <laughs> is persuasive because you can show up on that first day of class Absolutely. with your sheet on hand and yep. a lot of times yep. you know yep. interest and excitement <laughs> and that's always it's really persuasive to faculty so but it's always great to put your name on the wait list it also helps us know as an institution, oh, we might need another section of the class. There's a lot of interest. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Now, what about students? So, you know, let's say I'm a student, I've done my due diligence, mm -hmm. I have a plan to go abroad in the spring, or I have a plan mm -hmm. to study at the field station, and something goes tragically awry. I, sure. you know, decide not to go abroad, or I twist my knee, I can't live out in the wilderness, yeah. and I need to make arrangements to be sure. back on campus. Is it possible? Absolutely, right? So at the beginning of the semester, there's a week of drop ad, and so if someone really needs to radically change their schedule for any kind of reason, you can make sure that that happens. And we'll get students back into the classes that make sense given where they're going to be located and what they need to do to keep moving in their academic plan. That's nice. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. And, <laughs> and right, if we know ahead of time, right, we can also do it on Skype or over the phone, right? We can always help get students make sure. And we don't want people to be anxious over the holidays. Right. So earlier is better. Exactly. But we'll take this as it comes. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Well, do you have any advice for students? Do you have any advice for students? Because it can be a little anxiety provoking. Do you, you want to go first? Registration? Yeah. The um, whole process from advising yeah. to registration to, you know, just sort of decision making. I think when it came to deciding for me, um, like I said, just which which courses did I, where I, was I interested in uh, before, even before I came to school? Um, outside of what I wanted to study um, primarily. So I think it's more of, I had to like curve how excited I was to take some courses because I knew I had to wait for them. Mm -hmm. uh, some courses require a, prere a, prereq yeah. a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. So like you have, to take, you have to take one thing before you could get there. So um, just yeah. trying to calm yourself and pace yourself um, yeah. and just kind of go along for that ride and just enjoy uh, the courses that you'll end up having to take. And then you kind of uh, appreciate it more when you get to those courses that you wanted to take. Mm. So just take your time, um, get the, the boring uh, required ones out of the way. Um, and, you know, you'll get to, the, to those courses that you mm. want to take eventually. Mm. I have to say, I was looking over and we had uh, Dr. Dries on talking about the first year curriculum mm -hmm. and the first year seminars look amazing. Yeah. I kind of want to take like they three or four titles. of them. Yeah, they look exciting. Uh, and I didn't get mm -hmm. any of that. I know, right? I'm mm -hmm. very jealous. Although upper division students had a chance last spring to preview some of those. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. Uh, but I want to take like three or four of them. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that is a once and done yeah. opportunity, right? Yeah. So, well, good luck. And I would <laughs> encourage advising for Professor Dan Schroeder for the First Year Foundations Club. I've heard he's <laughs> really good. I've heard that too. <laughs> I've heard rave reviews. He's all right. 
Wait, so can I give my advice? Yes. All right. Uh, be curious, be brave, and ask good questions. All right. You know, not like faculty advisors, absolutely, but as you've, I think, sort of indicated, ask your friends, right? Mm. You know, there's lots of good advice out there and, and information about courses and experiences. So. And if parents are sort of hearing distress from their students yeah. and sort of, or students are asking questions, families don't know maybe mm -hmm. what those answers are, who sure. to go to. Is Quest a good contact Absolutely. for Absolutely. We are yes. happy to answer parents' questions if there's something that, yeah, that seems confusing or you're not quite sure how to help your, support your students to find the answers that they need. You can always call us. We are happy to chat with parents. Or Quest at Juniata.edu. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I would say, right, if your students are asking questions, ask them. Have you seen your mentor? Have you seen your academic advisor? Academic advisor? Um, because if they haven't yet, those folks will have answers and, and help as well. Well, Celia, thank you so much. Thanks for having me back. It was, it was great to be here. Always a pleasure. <laughs> I look you, forward to the next time. You need to be in your office the next time I come. All right. I'll, oh. I'll be better. Okay. I was expecting a hug. Look at that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll try not to fail you next time. And, oh, and my Dan, gosh. Dan was at the, at the vet. So Ooh. I didn't get to see either the coffin cook off things that day. Or the pet. I was very disappointed. Or the new puppy. Finn. I saw, Finn. I saw the puppy too. A Bernoodle. A Bernoodle. Oh, it's such Finn a little edition. beauty. Yes, yes. All right. Well, thanks for <laughs> Thank having you, me. Celia. And I will see you all Take soon. Care. I will. You guys as well. Well, uh, our second guest, and we're excited uh, to welcome her, is uh, come on over. Come on oh. over. She she had her set up with pillows. We have oh, okay. a low, we have a low chair. So oh, we have a low chair. It's a low, okay, it's a cushion to raise you. Okay, up. I think I'm good. <laughs> I remember Josh Groban? I lift you up. I lift I you up. <laughs> Just if you uh, see me falling, reach out. I got you. <laughs> okay. Well, it is a delight, I think, to welcome you know one of my most just valued colleagues, a beautiful person, an incredible educator. Dr. Cy DeVries. Oh, that's me. <laughs> From oh sociology. <laughs> it uh, is a pleasure. But, but the beauty is, you know, you're trained in social justice issues. You're trained in thinking critically about the systems and institutions that sort of shape and guide us culturally and helping students to make visible the invisible, help mm -hmm. them to be the change they want to see in the world. And now you're moving from a classroom faculty role in part to the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion to shepherd our Plexus program, to do campus-wide programming around diversity and inclusion and equity to really, I think, give practice space to the work that you've been doing in the classroom with students and, and helping them to engage in. And I love seeing you in the role. And it is just a pleasure to sort of welcome you here to, to talk with our families. It is a joy to be here. Um, the praxis has always been the challenging part. You know, academically, you can assign a reading, you can say a thing, you can rely on uh, the champions of the past, but then to actually put that into motion and to be of assistance to students and faculty colleagues as well is is both challenging and super rewarding. So yeah. I'm grateful for this opportunity. Well, you have been a Genietian for a while, <laughs> as I say, at least five years. At least five years, <laughs> times uh, four. <laughs> but for some time, and you know, it's, it's uh, wonderful to see students come back to serve on the Alumni Advocates Panel and you had them in class as undergraduates or students to come back at homecoming and, you know, to see you have those connections with them. But you've seen a lot of how Juniata has evolved around equity, diversity, and inclusion. Can you speak to some of the improvements that you've seen that have sort of brought you joy? Well, I think the thing that thrills me most is the presence of an infrastructure. And so when I came, um, I have the dubious distinction of being the first tenured African-American faculty member in the history of the institution. Huzzah! Huzzah! <laughs> yeah, it's not been an easy route, but um, it shows you the degree of change that we've come through. So the first thing that I really celebrate is the development of an infrastructure. We didn't have an Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in um, 2000 when I came here. Mm -hmm that didn't exist. Um, 
We now have a Dean of Institutional Equity and Inclusive Excellence. We started with an Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Now we're an Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. I've seen an incredible increase in the number of minority students. There were five African American students and six Hispanic students when I first came here. Mm -hmm. um, and now there are, the numbers are, have grown and I should have looked that number up. I don't have an exact number, but it is a significant portion of our student body. About one in five of our students About, identify as students of color. Uh, yes. And that is from five to one in five is an amazing transformation. Yeah, it's wonderful. It feels really, really good. Did, did, did you, did we tell you about the, we had a meeting on Monday. Um, we, he, he was in an earlier episode, Calvin Bembry. Ah. Calvin Bembry and Dr. Well, did you, did you have part in it too? I didn't. I, I helped the coordination piece. So I'm, I'm a behind the scenes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, Dr. Sai was in it. Um, Dr. Marita Gilbert had a uh, part in, you know, the behind the scene constructing the, the group as well. But Calvin um, spearheaded the, the group, the group on Monday. It was called, uh, it was just a men in color group. Oh, that's and, awesome. And we, it was, the number was pretty big, I'd say. It was the most um, men of color I've seen in one in one place here at any given time. And it had to be about 20 to 30 of us. Oh, that's wonderful. And there were some people that were missing too, um, that, that I knew of. And um, they just weren't able to make it. They had... Um, previous obligations but it was it was a great to see it was a great time to be there um it was only for an hour because it was the first time it was the first meeting mm -hmm. and uh we were just trying to make sure that we had a time that everyone could meet but it was it was really great to be around other people that looked like me there were also Hisp hispanic men there um there was a a book I don't know what the proper term is. Well, was it a policing brown, anymore? A brown man? <laughs> he he wasn't African American, but okay. I, I I never I I never know the correct term. Was he Muslim, Islamic? I don't know the correct term. I don't know the student, so I don't know how he identifies. He, he looked but... Middle Eastern. Well, well, we don't does, does that work? Does that, that work? That works. Okay, that works. so there there was. Um, there was okay. diversity in the room. It was a lot. And Even among surprised. men of color, there's a great deal of diversity on our campus. And that is also super exciting. It was a great time because we were able to, as as uh, speaking for myself, as a black man, is you have to curve the way that you speak to, to people that don't look like you. So um, it kind of felt nice that I didn't have to put in that filter because I could it's not like I have all these things to say that I kind of just keep inside, but it's just the way that you interact with one another. Yeah. And it was, it was, it felt easy. It felt easier talking in that group than it was at any given time that it was last year when, when I was here. So I really appreciate that and the numbers will grow and thank you for having part in that. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, one of the things that I hear you, saying is that there's real value in having time and space with other folks who share maybe similar experiences, similar backgrounds, similar ways of navigating the world. Not that everyone's uh, it, it entirely or exactly the same, but there are commonalities. And in a space that is a majority space, you have to temper some of those experiences. And we all do that. And then there are moments when you can sort of relax a little bit. And, uh, and creating spaces like that on our campus is, I think, one of the essential pieces uh, of the work that we do and the work that happens in equity, diversity, and inclusion. And some of those are around sort of racial identity and diversity. Some are around religious identity and diversity. Some are around, you know, kind of gender and, uh, and sex or sexual orientation. There are a lot of ways that people need to sort of express and identify their identity. And, and I really believe in the construct of intersectionality. You're not just ever one thing. 
So you have your racial identity, you have your ethnic heritage, which is different from your racial identity often. You have your region of the country that you're from. You have your sexual identity, your sexual orientation. You have your, all of those things are you. And to be able to genuinely express every component of you is, is a gift and a blessing. And it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for growth. Because if I'm walking around thinking, oh, no one wants to see this and I got to tamp this down or someone's not going to understand my telling of this experience, it makes it a very isolating and lonely place. Mm -hmm. And no one needs to be there. So whether you're the farmer's son from Iowa or the... That's you. That's you. Or if you're the farm girl who moved to the Bronx when she was a kid, you have a space. And it's important to be able to acknowledge who you are and to feel good about allowing that expression to come through. My, my dad says every, t every time that I go home and I, I'm going to be coming back to school, um, he always tells me, don't don't change. Never forget who you are, and stay. Be you. Stay you. And I've I I've yet to feel like I'm wavering from who I from who I was a year ago when I left. But it's like um, when I leave my room, I kind of have like this um, shell, and I just keep myself in that shell. I've I felt like I was missing something. Like I had my, how you say, intersectionality. I had my, sec I had my nerd section. I had, <laughs> kind of, I had my athlete section. I had all these sections, but and of the the black men that I knew on campus, I never had them like in a space to have that space um, to ourselves and just be black men. So. Um, now I feel like it's completed. Like I, all my my sections around the campus are there for me to express myself, because I can't be a nerd around everyone, and I can't be a black man around everyone. Because oh, some God. some people just aren't aren't. I can't connect with them. Like they, I will say something and that they won't understand, and they'll try their best. No one around here will be disrespectful to how I express myself, but they just won't understand. Like I. The energy won't necessarily be reciprocated. Yeah. So that, that's 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 the kind of thing that I was missing. At the same time, I feel like, you know, and I went to school without much exposure to people who are different than me as a farm kid from Iowa. And some of the most enriching experiences I had were across those boundaries where I was learning or I was teaching. And I think that that's a big part of the work of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Can you talk a little bit about how some of that emerges? in intentional ways? So I think at least departmentally or programmatically, our goal is to make sure that everyone has an understanding of the value of where they're from and who they are, and then how to share that. Because it's not a deficit, it's not a problem to be from a minority group or to be from another country. It's an enrichment to this mm, space. Absolutely. And it's something that's going to really enable you as you move forward in your life. I'm not going to say it, you're out of forever. You're going to be here for four years. And you will find that the world has a great deal of diversity. And it's so, a very short four years, by the way. It, go is, it very goes short. very quickly. It goes very quickly. Sorry to cut you off. No, no. No, it's an, it's an important piece to hold on to. So while you're here, you need to get yourself ready for that next step. I mean, it would be great if you may just come in, just stay, just take all the classes forever. that you want. Stay like forever. Like you guys, you guys, you guys are still college students. Actually, my dad thinks I am. <laughs> he doesn't understand my job at all. So I know I'm just going to let that slide because there are people in the Caribbean that are wondering, she seems so bright as a child. Why is she still in school? So yes, that is a thing. But, but the point that I'm attempting to make here is if you spend your time in college being the person that you were before you came to college, it's kind of a waste of your energy and a waste of the opportunity. So use your college space to get to know people that you wouldn't have met back home.
because they're not back home, but they are here. In your home community, you may not have people from 24 countries. Here you do. At your home, you may not interact with people who are native speakers of a second language. Get to know those people in this context. Understand their community because, well, one, developmentally, you need to do that. You're trying to grow. You're not trying to keep the person that you came in as. You're trying to enhance that person. And second, if you kind of want a job after college, it's a thing that employers are looking for. So it's really important to employers that you are not freaked out by diversity, that you are able to work with and communicate with people who are not exactly like you because the world is, the global world is changing. We're having interactions all across the globe, both in cyberspace, but also in real time. And so you use these opportunities in college they're a speaker that talks about a place or a thought that is not common to what you've experienced before. Sample a cuisine from a culture that you might not have been exposed to before. Hear a play or listen to music produced by someone who is from a different cultural frame. It enhances who you are and it enhances your college experience. Well, we have, you know, and I can sort of reflect on my own college experience. I, I remember seeing Condoleezza Rice speak on our campus. I remember seeing Justice Anthony Kennedy speak on our campus. I mean, those are moments mm. that you never let go of. And we have those folks on our campus. Not those specific folks, well, but those folks. Equivalent uh, folks. We, had, this one. we have Peyton Head <laughs> on our campus who led sort of the student body at Mizzou when uh, there was a lot of social disruption on campus. We had Keith Boykin, who is a correspondent, a news um, sort of commentator on our campus, talking to our students about the state of politics in, uh, in the country. It was powerful to sort of hear these voices of folks. Then they come through different channels, like the EDI Speaker Series, which is ongoing even now. Can you talk a little bit about what we have oh, on deck? Oh, my goodness. So I'm super excited. Um, on October 29th, we have an award-winning playwright from New York City. Um, she is going to perform the play They Call Me Q, which is a story, basically the one-woman show that's the story of her life. So as an immigrant from Bombay, she landed in the Bronx, Eva, sorry, I'm from the Bronx. It's just a thing I have to. I love um, that. I love it. And she will talk about her journey to the American woman that she is now through her high school years and her exposure to African Americans and Latinas and Latinos. And she plays 27 she different plays, characters, yes. right? It sounds yes. amazing. And I'm really looking forward to that. She's a, a broad, uh, an award winning Broadway playwright. And she's coming here. It sounds very familiar. It should. It was it all over the news a couple of years ago. Yes. And we were so excited that we're coming here. To hear. It felt like something I spoke about in a class. Like this story specifically. It was like she she was she came from um uh African country. Or was it a Caribbean in, country? An Indian country. She Indian was from country. India. Okay. It was it was a story similar. It was a African woman who came to America and she couldn't find her niche because she didn't quite, I did, she couldn't relate to African-Americans. Like they, she couldn't relate to the black folk as she, as she put it. And she couldn't relate to the, to the other Africans who became African-Americans mm. because they were trying so hard to be American. And she she like she saw the difference between the two, mm -hmm. and she didn't quite identify with either. She said, "I am me." She was an insider outsider, yes, living yeah, kind of in an interstitial space. So she was kind of just acknowledging all her experiences with um, the world, looking at her as a black woman, and black people looking at her as an African. It was like, and she felt um, completely isolated, and 
was that kind of what that story is like? And so, yeah, she has a very similar story. She is a woman from Bombay, a teenager at that time from Bombay, and everyone is curious about what she is because she, you know, doesn't appear to be any of the boxes that we put people in um, ethnically or racially. And so she talks about discovering herself in this broad world of people that don't see her as quite fitting into those boxes and how she took all of those things. And as you described it, keeping that shell, keeping that wholeness, acknowledging who she is, but also acknowledging why it's so challenging for these people that she interacts with. And I'm super excited about Martha Redbone, who's coming to campus as well. Performer, musician, just incredibly talented artist. As part of the Junietta Presents series. As part of Junietta Presents. um, EDI Speaker Series is also uh, bringing in Brian Terrell Clark. This is going to be the closest that I get to Hamilton. From Hamilton. Hamilton. This is the closest (laughs) I'm getting to Hamilton. (laughs) This ticket is free. This one, I'm going. (laughs) I know. It's going to be amazing. Um, Beverly Gooden. world-renowned uh, speaker, lecturer on women's issues and feminism and equality. So all of those things come to us. As a student, it's a, it's a marvelous opportunity to take advantage of seeing the world, not through your own eyes, but through the eyes of people that have had very different experiences and very different worldviews than yours. It's an imperative. And, uh, and, and I'll hold those up and say, every student should go to those programs and okay. uh, encourage you as families to encourage students to take advantage of that. You know, the other program that I love, and it's one of my favorites as a part of the EDI speaker series, is the Who's Your Neighbor program, which I want you to tell us about because it, it offers that same opportunity from our own community. So Who's Your Neighbor was designed to really help students, faculty, and staff see the campus as more than just its educational institutional function. We are people. It's a radical (laughs) thought. And those people come from very different places, um, both geographically different, but also Um, structurally, emotionally different places. And so we have had a series of these over the past two years where we have four to five individuals stand up and share some component of their life, sharing their their worldview, their mindset. Um, In November, we're going to have the second of our uh, first generation who's your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Because I think that when students see the professor or the administrator, they don't think of the similarities that are in their lives. Many of our students are first-generation students. This is the first time that they've come to college. They're the first person in their families that have come to college. There's a... (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Me too. There's a lot that you won't know if this is your first experience. And so we need our students to understand We're not these mythical beings. Many of us are first-generation college students. We know those struggles. We know that, you know, you can't pick up the phone and call Daddy the Professor to say, oh, I'm having difficulties working through this. And if you can be Professor Sai and I can be Dean Matthew, then they can too. Absolutely. They can be successful. Absolutely. Because we're not going to work forever. Right? That's right. We're That's eventually right. going to retire. <laughs> so we want people to understand that they have a pl- if they so choose, there's a place in the academy for them. They can set their sights on, oh, I want to help people in this specific way in the context of higher education. Yeah. So I, I'm so thrilled for Who's Your Neighbor. Um, again, a slate of first generation college administrators and faculty members who will share their stories and hopefully inspire and hopefully take away a little bit of that awkwardness, you know, the story of I didn't know what to do when. First generation students have those experiences. Those are not going to be experiences that stop you in your process. Those are going to be experiences that will make a great Thanksgiving story someday. That's right. Well, uh, you know, some of the other programming that takes place is cultural celebrations. Mm -hmm. 
and we have some of those coming up. Can you talk about the value of cultural celebrations on campus? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine this a little bit. We like to make um, cultural exploration easy. And what's the easiest way to do that? Food. <laughs> and so many of our cultural celebrations center around sharing the food of your culture. Um, this weekend, we're going to have the Latin American Student Organization mm -hmm. hold their um, Hispanic Heritage Month dinner. They are, are selling tickets now. If your students haven't gotten a ticket, they should. And you can Venmo for the ticket. Which is seven like bucks new on campus. Seven mm -hmm. bucks cheaper than a pizza. That's right. Just saying, great home cooked food from many Latin American cultures. It's an it's an opportunity to not just eat food from a different place, but to understand a little bit about the culture from that place. Oh, the things that we buy in a plastic bag, we think of as tortilla. There are people who come from communities where tortillas are made by hand right, like right now, today. Um, and so getting to learn a little bit about that makes exploring the culture easier. And there's, I think, elements of sort of beyond the food culture that get built into those programs. And so sometimes there's dance, sometimes there's performance, Music. sometimes there's poetry or literature. Um, I, I think that there are oftentimes kind of richly embodied traditions that get um, conveyed in the context of food. Food brings mm -hmm. you into the room. <laughs> right. Food brings you into the and room. And then sort food, of and, and once solves. your defenses are down and you're calm and you're happy and you're mm -hmm. eating, nice and you're, docile. <laughs> you're exposed to all of these wonderful elements. Um, and it's really valuable to allow yourself that vulnerability to go into a room where you're going to hear music that's not familiar to the music that you've grown up with. Yeah because this is what the world is like. Yeah. Well, the Japanese dinner also, also happens, happens this, this weekend. This weekend. Uh, lots of opportunities, I think, for students to take part. And going forward, they will just continue to sort of uh, manifest. And, uh, and students oftentimes can buy tickets in Ellis on the way into Baker. Um, it is ubiquitous, uh, the sort of marketing that goes into uh, into those dinners. And so I encourage, I encourage you to encourage your students to take part as they can. Um, but, you, you know, one of the hard things, I think, maybe especially for first year students, is to take that first step into uh, an unfamiliar situation or something that feels like a stretch opportunity. And I, I think, you know, I don't know certainly what that is in the way that you know what it is. Because in this campus, you know, I walk into a room of mostly white people. It always feels comfortable to me. And I know the experience, you know, of people of color on our campus is a little different sometimes to walk into a room where you might be the only one or you might feel like you're isolated a little bit. How, how do you sort of as a student or what advice can you give a student who maybe feels like, I want to do this? But I'm tentative, I'm anxious, I'm nervous about taking that step in, into a room at some point. I think the most important thing to recognize is that the nerves won't go away. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Do it nervous. Do it tentatively. Do it cautiously, but do it. Bring a friend. Bring a friend. Bring the, you know, the room and hey, let's, we were going to go get a pizza together yep. at, you know, name the pizza place. Instead, let's go spend seven bucks and go do this dinner. But take the opportunity, even if it feels a little tenuous, um, bring a friend, um, talk to the organizers. Um, Occasionally, faculty members will give extra credit oh, for these opportunities. And um, so inquire of your faculty members, um, but use all of the opportunities. So, you know, if we, you know, I, I'm thinking of a good analogy. If, we, if our Nobel laureate in physics came back to our campus. Dr. Bill Phillips, and he does every year. We He's have, wonderful. We have a Nobel laureate in physics. <laughs> physics students are going to take the opportunity to stretch and do something different and to just be in the space with this person, yeah. right? And so take the opportunity to stretch and be in the space 
with something that's different, something that's unusual for you. Um, if nothing else, it's an experience and a story for the Thanksgiving table. <laughs> it is that lean in moment. And I, you know, I've told my first year foundations class, if you're comfortable in every situation on campus, you're not doing it right. <laughs> I, I, I often remind myself, if I'm ever feeling uncomfortable about doing, going to do something, um, usually because I would be isolated as the only like black man in the situation around, um, I remind myself I'm a, I'm a minority in the first place. So there's a lot of times where I'm going to be the only one doing something. This I'm often put in a box and expected to stay in that box. So most of the thing, most of the things that I do is outside of the box. So I have to get used to doing things that I want to do, regardless of who, who might be looking at me, what, how I may be perceived. I have to remember that I'm doing things for me, um, and it, the outside noise doesn't necessarily doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, like, I I I do as I want. I am as who I want to be, and nothing is going to decide that. No, nothing, and no one will decide that for me. That's great. And as you come into uh, new spaces, as you mature, that becomes more of the norm. I mean, when you went to high school, in many high schools, um, everyone was like you or very similar to you. And you didn't recognize that. You saw, oh, there's that group and there's that faction. You didn't really think about it. Now you're in this new space and it feels like, oh, everything is so different. And it may very well be different than what you anticipated, but different is not bad. No. Different is different. And that is not to say that you're going to like every new thing that you try. You're not going to like every new cuisine. You're not going to like every new thought that you've been exposed to. But the key is you've been exposed to it, you can process it, and you can think about how you will use that experience to move you forward in the future. Because all of it is about moving forward, moving towards that graduation. I was blessed to go to the high school that I went to, um, Brooklyn Technical High School. Brooklyn's best. <laughs> Brooklyn's best. I got this. I got this for being a football all star. It's not a school thing. That's all right. It's a me being great thing. But anyway, I was blessed to go to the high school that um, I went to. Uh, I had to take a test to get in, but by um, you know the you know whatever powers they that be, I got in and. Um, it was a school of 6,000 kids. Um, it was oh about, gosh, it was about, a, it was about, uh, what was the percentages? I think it was about 60%, um, white students, um, maybe about 20, 20 ish percent Asian, uh, mm -hmm. students. And then the rest, just the rest of the numbers, numbers dwindled from there. Yeah. So I did, I already didn't have a lot of uh classmates that looked like me um despite you know where i where i where i was i was in new york city where you know i was in the middle of of brooklyn like dead center and i was surrounded by people that didn't look like me for the most part uh the um and i was thrust from my primary my primary school to where it was all black people where I kind of wanted to fit in with the cool with the cool kids, and I felt like I was in that box, and this is where you had to be in that box to to be looked at a certain way, and then all of a sudden I'm put in this in this setting where most of the kids around me are weird, um, you know that's that's selective, but um, most of them would agree that they're nerds and they're kind of weird, but everyone when everyone is like that, it's kind of like no one is like that at all, like that's just the new standard. And I got to embrace being who I was, and I was able to um, surround myself with, with some friends that uh, loved me as a friend for being who I was. We, um, on the football team, there weren't many of many teammates of mine that looked like me. Um, my best friend in high school is, is a um, white, white guy, uh, Michael Markovici. That was, Hi, Michael. What up, Mike? That's my, that was my quarterback. That was, that was my best friend. My, one of my other close, close friends is, uh, Sebastian. 
he was um, Colombian and I had a, a brown good good friend Ifaz and I had more, I had Asian good friends and it was like I was able to adapt to people that didn't look like me who didn't sound like me who didn't talk like me who didn't act like me and so, not just adapt but be enriched, be enriched by. by yes yes, yes. be enriched by yeah. really everyone who comes into your space into your world is an opportunity to learn and grow about another experience and that's the beauty of this place i think that is why you know we sort of invite diversity onto our campus and into our educational environments because it is in those spaces that we have the best outcomes and it's important to us it's a part of our ethos and our character and our mission and uh and it's richly rewarding i think it's part of what drives me to stay in the academy and, and do this critical work i definitely feel as though like when you're surrounded by people like uh I, when you're surrounded by people that aren't like you they're all like one way and you're a different way you kind of conform to that one way but when you're surrounded by people that are all different none of them are are one select you know kind of person one sort of um behavior you start to you stay who you are you more embrace of everything that you are and you just be different along with everybody else so everybody is different and you embrace being the person that you are and you kind of embrace everything that everyone else is everyone kind of um kind of brushes off on each other as opposed to a one group brushing off on you and you not being who you are i think the reality is you know we talk about diversity percentages and we talk about compositional diversity at the end of the day we are 100 percent diverse mm. everyone is different and if we can acknowledge that then it shouldn't be scary to talk to someone who is not you and you can talk to yourself it's okay <laughs> but it's also important to talk to someone who is not you who is not like you and so that's where we begin our growth if I stay in my room and I just talk to the people that I went to high school with and I just talk to people that look like me, I'm not going to have the same kind of richness and growth if I take a moment to step out and see what's around me. Because that's going to give you preparation to step out from this lovely campus and start your career in whatever arena it's going to be in. That was not my fault. It was my fault. <laughs> not my fault <laughs> well Sai, i think that is a perfect moment to sort of say thank you i love your perspective i love the work that you're doing with students i just and, have to uh, tell you this was so much fun here. okay speaking of nerdness <laughs> pages of notes ready to answer questions uh, this was so much fun. the ultimate schoolie, <laughs> I know, I'm schoolie. well thank we also so appreciate so much your being with us thank you for your time tonight we'll be back uh, next week with a little bit more, actually we move from Wednesday night to Tuesday night at seven. We'll be talking about financial aid and planning in the spring billing cycle. And uh, until then, wings up. Wings Go up. Eagles. <laughs> Go, Go Eagles. Go Eagles. <laughs> See, I got it. I got you it. Got you got it. it.